All right. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. This is kind of a quick session, so I hope that you've all been certified in speed listening. Um, let me proceed here. This is, a, you can see that I'm a gray beard over there on the right. You can read all the rest of this other stuff here on the left uh, at some future point in time. I'd like to talk about uh, uh, performance competence requirements. I mean, we should begin with the end in mind. And we also need to think not only about the performance competence that we're, we're uh, trying to develop, but that it transfers back to the job and that it has performance impact. So begin with the end in mind and then focus on transfer. Transfer is extremely important and it's too often neglected uh, by those of us who practice in the ISD space, if you will. So performance competence requirements, I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, my definition for performance competence is the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. Now I call it performance competence. I could have called it performance uh, capabilities, but I was borrowing the word competence from the late Tom Gilbert and his book, the 1978 classic, Human Competence. Mm -hmm. And in that he, as Carl Binder may chip in here a little bit later on, uh, he talked about accomplishments and being accomplishments based and focusing on accomplishments. And within that, he talked about worthy outputs. And to me, worthy outputs meet all of the stakeholder requirements, the downstream customer, the regulators, uh, the shareholders, et cetera. There's a lot of stakeholders that we need to be cognizant about. Right. Um, here's a word of warning before we start. Just because an ISD -er or an LXD -er nowadays can uncover a valid learning need does not in and of itself warrant meeting that need. Now, I have a bias to um, looking at what's the worth of our instructional endeavors, our learning and development endeavors here. And I think we too often tackle and build content, develop content, when we should have just left it to informal learning means. I tend to look at things in terms of their return on investment. There's many ways to measure that kind of thing. But... Um, we too often, when we do look at what are we investing, we too often look at simply the first cost and not the life cycle costs. So if we have some volatile content that we're gonna to have to update all the time to keep it evergreen, um, that's gonna cost the shareholders, if you will, uh, you know, a lot of money. And perhaps the value proposition for that instruction doesn't warrant making that kind of investment. So there are things that we can uncover that, yeah, people need to learn uh, in order to be able to do their jobs, but perhaps we can leave that to informal and social learning means. My first day on the job back in August, 1979, I was given a three page mimeograph of a 1970 newsletter from Praxis, the consulting business of Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler. And they talked in that about guidance and how guidance, which was later known as job aids, um, was appropriate and a way to avoid forcing people to memorize things. And I think it's important when we do analysis that we look at what does the performance context, context require or allow? Does it require a memorized performance response or would it allow a referenced performance response? And if we can get by with just standalone job aids and provide the learner, which is really a performer, what they need in order to do the job without forcing them to memorize things when the performance context itself does not demand a memorized performance response, that's what we should do. Now, back in 1979, when I, in my first job out of college in a training organization, our clients hated the idea of standalone job aids. They hated it. So we simply embedded job aids in our training programs. And we met our clients' needs for training, but we met the performers' needs for guidance in the workflow. Uh, it used to be called process back in the old days, but if you're you know, cool and hip, you know it as workflow nowadays. Same thing. Um, and we should reserve our investments in training when we need to create memorization and or we need to hone critical skills. 
especially where the performance context demands honed critical skills or a memorized performance response. So that's just my uh, preface at the beginning of this here. Uh, this is what we're gonna be talking about. This was the original lesson map format in 1990 on a project for Illinois Bell on labor relations. And you can see there's, there's a, a hints at three columns there on the, on the form. It's lecture, demonstration, and exercise. This was gonna be for an instructor-led training course. It was a four-day labor relations course for new supervisors. But, it's, but I changed the format shortly thereafter and created this format. And this is the one I've been using since, um, you know, 92 or 93. Uh, there's an information column. There's a demonstration column, and there's an APO, or excuse me, application, the practice and feedback that hone critical skills and help develop memory. Mm -hmm. And of course, if the job itself isn't going to be reinforcing what I've memorized in my training session, then we may need to do space learning and such so that I don't forget things as I uh, uh, move on from the training. So the, the lesson map is one of three design uh, tools that I use. The first one is a, a lesson, uh, excuse me, an event map. And you see up on the top left-hand corner, unless you're looking at this on your smartphone, it says event map of lessons. It's like looking at the United States and what do you see? Oh, a bunch of states. So an event map kind of is the high level architectural view, if you will, of the instruction. It's got an open and a close, and then you can see there are seven things in the middle there, and those are what I call lessons. And if my language is problematic for you in your context, change it all. I've had to do that kind of thing myself. So this event map of lessons then would have seven of lesson maps. And for those of you whose screen is large enough, you can see up in the top, right-hand corner there, it says lesson map of instructional activities. And those are all the little rectangular boxes there in the info, demo, and APO columns. And this is how I present, this is how I create the design working with uh, a design team, if you will, we'll get to that in a little bit. And this is how I present it to my clients to get their approval or revisions. And so for every one of these little rectangular box in there, they would get an instructional activity specification. So there's three levels to my design outputs. When I put together a design document, it's got all of this kind of stuff in there. And the instructional activity spec is where the, is the lowest level of detail. It's where we identify the specifics of the content, how that's gonna be treated uh, when it's delivered or deployed. Uh, what source materials we have for it, who are the experts for this particular chunk of the modular design. So um, the lesson map here uh, of instructional content includes what are the lesson objectives, what are the APOs or application exercises, is a demo needed? Yes or no is the answer. And if we need one, we'll put one in and this is where it might go. And then there's the information. And so we've rocked around the clock kind of clockwise on that. Let me do this again here. But there's also the lesson open and close. And there's a standard kind of thing here where we tell everybody what, what the lesson is about, what the learning objectives are. We try to connect to their prior knowledge, et cetera. And at the close, this is where we would do the debriefing, which if those of you who are followers of Tiagi, uh, where he used to say, he doesn't say it anymore, all learning happens in the debriefing. So if we have structured debriefings of a lesson, this is where I would put them, unless I'm going to bundle a bunch of lessons and debrief several lessons uh, later on. But this is how I uh, package the, uh, the design, if you will. So here's an example, a made up example of how to conduct an ISD intake process here. And there's the objectives, there's the application exercises, there's the demonstrations that precede the application exercises and the information and the open and close. No big deal, right? All right, so what data feeds lesson mapping? I mean, where does this information come from that you put on this lesson map guy? Well. It comes from two devices in particular that I've been using since I learned 
a derivative of a derivative of the Gary Rumler approach to instructional analysis back in 1979. They called what I call the performance model, he called a performance table, he and Tom Gilbert. Um, and, this, and that's what we called it when I first started doing this and I changed the language of this uh, later on. It's sometimes known as a job model, but there's various names for the same kind of a thing here, but it captures the performance. And then that's used to der systematically derive the knowledge and skills that enable that performance. And those two sets of data, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, feed the construct of a lesson map. So there's multiple charts, performance model uh, charts, if you will, that are often uh, used to pull content from to then put into the instructional design of a lesson map. And there's usually several chart different matrices of data that also feed the lesson map. Now it all depends on the scope of what it is you're tackling. If it's something short and simple, you wouldn't have all of this. If it's something larger like labor relations for uh, new supervisors, then there may be a little bit more to it than just a page or two of information. So the performance table data and the enabling knowledge and skill data feed the lesson map. Um, and here's again, two examples that we're gonna look at them at a bigger uh, format here in just a second. The performance model or job model or whatever you need to call it identifies what are the outputs, beginning with the end in mind, way over there on the left, what are the key outputs and how are they measured? I always ask, how can you tell a good one from a bad one? And when I'm working, generating this data, I'm normally trying to do this with a facilitated group process of master performers and other subject matter experts. And I form them into a group and we meet for one or two or three days, depending on what the scope it is that we're tackling and we do this analysis. And I get them to articulate and, and try to come to consensus on, so what are the outputs? If we were in the design phase of an anti model, I mean, what are the outputs? Is there a design document? Is there more than that, like a presentation to the client? Um, are there other things that are used to prepare before you create the design? Are those outputs of the ISD or if you will? So we try to identify what are the outputs what are the measures associated with those outputs? What are the tasks associated with those outputs? And what are the roles and responsibilities associated with those outputs aligned to the tasks? And you can see on the performance model chart there, depending on your screen size, um, that's what I call the ideal performance. If I've assembled a group of eight to 12 master performers and maybe a subject, another subject matter expert, maybe we need somebody from regulatory affairs or from safety or some, something, um, to make sure that you know we get their uh, twist on the on the performance correctly, um, we can articulate that and capture that. And again, this constitutes ideal performance. And then on the right hand side of this chart, we can identify well what are the typical performance gaps, and what are their probable causes, and and how do we what kind of cause is that, and that constitutes the performance gaps against the ideal performance. But to me, it's always important that when we train people, we don't say, hey, it's as easy as one, two, three, and then you produce an output. There may be rocks in the road, barriers to performance that people have to contend with. And while I've got the master performers in the room, I want to understand from them, where do the outputs typically not meet the measures for the non-master performers in your world? And they seem to always know. And so they can tell me, here's the typical performance. Gap. We're not looking for something that happens every 47 years. We're looking for the typical kinds of things. Because when we train the learners who are performers, we need to teach them how to perform and how to anticipate the barriers to performance and avoid them if they can, and what to do if they were unavoidable. So we need the strategies and tactics of master performers or what Tom Gilbert called exemplars and others call uh, top performers or star performers. Again, many different labels we can put on, on this and change my language uh, to meet your needs. But so what are those typical things? And I always look at the outputs and the measures and say, where are other people falling short? And then what are the probable gap causes off the tops of the heads of the master performers? Why do you think the non-master performers aren't master performers? And they usually have their reasons. 
And then I can take each one of those, and I don't call it a root gap cause because I'm not asking why five times on each and every one of these things because I don't have time because I'm doing this in a, you know, a one or a two or a three day meeting and there's a lot to do. And so I just want to know what do these people think? Now, just because I can get a group of master performers to come to consensus on what ideal performance is and what the gaps are and why doesn't make them right. But who else would you ask? Yeah, true. You can validate this is necessary by doing observations, et cetera, uh, after you've captured this kind of data, if that's necessary. Um, and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But we can look at the gap causes and attribute them to and I've changed Gilbert's stuff here, Carl, so please forgive me. But the deficiency of environment, um, where is the environment falling short in giving the performers what they need in order to get the job done? And what, what of these causes are deficiency of the knowledge and skills of the person doing the performance? And are there other individual attributes that could be deficient, a DI in my code there at the bottom? And lately I've been using deficiency of the process. There is no process or it's not adhered to or the process doesn't work and the master performers say, I would never follow the company process because that would be stupid. So I'm not doing that. I'm a master performer and I'm gonna get the job done. So I do it this way. And so therein lies some of the tension that you can uncover when you're doing this kind of analysis. But so that's some of the data that we use. Now, it's more than just one performance model chart. This is an example from the 1980s when gas stations started putting convenience stores into the gas station. Uh, my client, um, that's what my project was with my client. And they, this is how they broke the job down into what I call areas of performance, could have been called accomplishments, could have been called major duties, could have been called key results areas. Again, we've got that language issue, but I call it areas of performance because all of those other labels have nuanced meanings to some people. And I decided to just forget that and not get trapped by that and carve out my own language and what I meant by an area of performance, which includes all those performance model charts. So there's at least one performance model chart for every area of performance. And we had looked at the one for A, staff recruiting, selection, and training. Um, oh, that's what's uh, on one of these here. So, but, so that's the idea. There's a whole bunch of analysis data focused on performance that we can generate depending on the scope of, of, the, of the effort that you've undertaken. In this case here, this was looking at the entire job of a store manager and I've uh, changed some of the data to protect my client. Um, anyway, so then that leads then to systematically deriving the enabling knowledge and skills. And here's an example. We use the performance models on the left to systematically derive what do you gotta know to be able to do. So there's the knowledge and skill items here and how they link back to areas of performance or major duties or whatever that need to be called. Do we select for that and screen for people? So we hire people who already know these things or does somebody get through without knowing that and therefore there's a training implication. So it's an S or a T. How critical is this to my ability to be a master performer? How difficult is it for the typical person to learn? How volatile is that content so that we can not package highly volatile content with stable content and in increase our costs for maintenance of the content over the life cycle. And then if we were to have training on this, just because we've captured this doesn't mean that we should. I mean, we might leave some of this to informal and social means, right? So do we take this, it, can we cover this at a very high level and create awareness or do we need to create a deeper knowledge or is there a skill implication in this before um, you know, we finish this part of the analysis? Now, you probably, I've driven you crazy already, but here's, it's even crazier. I have 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills that I use to systematically derive. What do you gotta know to be able to do? And when I first started off back in the early eighties, this was a list of eight categories and then it grew to 12 and now it's at 17 and it's been 17 since probably 1987 or 88, something like that. But this is how I used to systematically tease out and keep people focused on what are the company policies and procedures and let's look at part A of the job and part B and part C and part D. And then we go down to laws, regulations and codes and industry standards and internal organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Focused on the category of knowledge and skills as we systematically derive 
from all of the performance model data that we have. And of course, not every knowledge and skill category is used in every project. I mean, we wouldn't use management and supervisory skills if we're talking to some individual contributors who report to supervisors and managers. Anyway, so what are your questions? I may have some answers. Well, we've got uh, one here. Um, uh, is there a difference uh, in approach when the performance is a new capability where there may not be master performers yet. Yes, that's very true. So then you have to figure out how you're gonna do the, uh, the best job of trying to pin that down and knowing that you may not quite get it right. You may have to do a lot of maintenance on this when you first start. But I had a, my, I had a client, Alcoa Laboratories, who was talking about casting alumina ingots mm -hmm. using gravitational forces and such rather than pouring the alumina into a, a cast. And they were going to suspend this thing in the midair. And I said, okay, so who's the, who's your master performer on that? And they go, well, we don't have one. And I said, well, who knows about this? Why are you even thinking about this? Well, there's this professor in Scotland. I said, well, you're going to have to get him because where does the source of knowledge of mastery or as close to mastery as some, you know, new evolving thing is, you know, so where do you get the sources from? So that's a pretty good question in that sometimes on new things, future things, we're taking our best guesses. And then we would need to bring in the right group of people to and facilitate them to come up with some process that we would train others on if, if, if that's what we're trying to do. Um, you know, sometimes we're not trying to train people on things. We're just trying to, you know, communicate them to make them generally aware of something or to, to educate them, to make them knowledgeable. But if we're trying to build performance capability, performance competence, you know, that's when you go to this level that I described. Okay, good, good point. Another question here, uh, does this approach help uh, prevent analysis paralysis? And if so, how? Well, when I, so, so I uh, would typically do this analysis in a, again, a one or a two day, three meetings, uh, day meeting, so that the cycle time is three days. Right. Um, rather than taking three weeks or three months to do the similar kind of analysis by going around and doing observations and interviews and document reviews, documenting all that, showing it to people that are going, okay, I recognize my stuff in there, but I don't recognize all this other stuff. What is all this other stuff? And so yeah. handling that as you go round and round and round trying to get it right. Sometimes that's, you, you, you've got to do it that way because the client cannot take the people off out of their performance context and give them to you for that amount of time. So it, there's a trade off there, but uh, so, but yeah, if you're, if I think it avoids analysis paralysis because I know exactly what data I want. I'm not guessing and, and capturing everything uh, that I may not need, um, but because I know I'm focused on, well, what are the outputs to be produced and how do we know a good one from a bad one? What are the measures for those things? What are the tasks? Who's doing what? What are the typical gaps in current state performance? Yeah, good. Another question here. Uh, do you have a guideline for the hours needed to develop an hour of good training for different type of tropics? Let me let me defer that because that, that there's so much variance in that that, uh, yeah, I used to be able to, to give a number on that, but I'm going to defer that till later on. Okay. Uh, what about uh, when conditions change, timelines change, organizational priorities change? Well, then you then you change your content. If they change the process, if they ch if the law changes and regulations change, no, you gotta change your content. Good. Yes, I agree. Let's move on. All right. So these are the questions. So I ask, and I'm setting this up. I had a client back at AT and T back in the uh, late '80s who who referenced me, referred me to one of their other internal AT&T organizations. I was going from network systems to microelectronics. And he asked if he could go along when I met with this prospect because he wanted to see me in action. He had seen me before. And so he, he was kind of joking about this. So I went in and, and met with these two people who wanted to describe this training effort that they wanted me to uh, bid on. And so I started, they, I, I did my best active listening in, in terms of, you know, what they were asking me for and all that stuff. And then I tried to lay out for them how we would go forward and we would do analysis, what Joe Harless would call front end analysis. Um, but 
they said, oh, no, we, you know, we don't need to do that. Uh, you know, we can just we can just give you the content. And you can package it for us. So I so I jumped up to their I believe it was a flip chart back in those days. And not everybody had whiteboards yet. But um, so I drew out this performance, this lesson map, and I started asking them questions about what the learning objectives were what the post-learning performance objectives were, because you know people are always thinking about what people got to know, and you were always we're not always thinking about what people got to do with what they know. Um, and then I asked them about how would people then, uh, what practice uh, with feedback could we have that would prove that people actually learned what they needed to learn before they went back to the job, and whether or not it'd be helpful for the learners to see that performance the, that would be covered in the application exercise before they did the exercise? And yes or no is the answer. But uh, what information would be needed to present and what content already exists? And then what barriers exist to you know, transfer back to the job? Well, when I've done this, and I've done this probably a half a dozen times in 40 years, but, but I often uncover the fact that the requester doesn't have the answers to my questions and therefore they begin to see that there's a need for doing this thing called analysis but they're worried about analysis paralysis as everybody should be. And uh, so then, you know, they allowed me to craft a project plan and a proposal and I did the project for them. Anyway, so back to the same thing here. So sometimes I, I've used this in the initial meeting with a client, but more often I'm using this after I've done a proper analysis. And when I get with, together with my design team, which is always a subset of my analysis team so that nobody has to you know, figure out what's this analysis data that was produced, you know, where did this come from? What do you mean by this? Because they were all part of that process generating it. We cover the learning objectives. We cover the performance objectives. So there used to be back in the day here, you know, two types of learning objectives, enabling and terminal. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure that everybody embraces all of that, but you know, they're the three-part behavioral objectives of Bob Mager, if you will. And then we ask about, you know, so what are the application exercises that would prove that people know and can perform appropriately? And then we would map those into the, uh, into the lesson map. And then whether or not it's helpful for learners to see the expected performance prior to the exercises, and yes or no is the answer. And so we might have a demo, we may not. What information needs to be presented? Oh, and to this point here, all of this data that goes into the less math comes off the performance model. And then when we get to this next part about what information needs, well, that primarily comes from the knowledge and skill matrices. And so that's how those two sets of data feed this. And then, you know, we want to always want to know what content already exists because we shouldn't be reinventing wheels. You know, shareholders have paid for content development in the past. Let's reuse it as is or after modification if we can. And then what are the barriers? And I always ask about the barriers because I want my clients and everybody to think about, yeah, what are those barriers? What would stop this? If Guy learned this in a training program and went back to the job, who's going to stop him from doing this new thing? the new way or something. And, and so how do we contend with all of that? These are issues for my clients to contend with because usually it's not part of this instruction. It may be some communications that needs to happen uh, um, or expectations set by the managers, by the clients and the stakeholders. Um, all right, so again, I can ask these two questions and I can get a learning objective. And when I write it down the first time, I don't polish it. I just write it down roughly. I try to capture exactly what they say and how they say it. I don't do noun verb, you know, uh, reports generated. I don't talk like that because nobody else talks like that. And uh, that's part of this language of the of Gilbert's behavior engineering model that Carl Binder has cleaned up in his uh, six boxes and performance thinking network uh, stuff. You should check that out. Anyway, so the application exercises then you know, could be, well, if we want people to be able to conduct an ISD intake process, maybe there's application of talking with the initial client. The next thing is to talking with the other stakeholders, talking some more with additional stakeholders, and then doing the interview without the interview guy. Can you do that? You know, so there's no job aid. We've taken the job aid away from you. And uh, let's see if you can do it. Um, because sometimes that's necessary in the real world. 
Um, then we want to understand whether or not there needs to be a demo, and maybe we need to demo conducting the initial client interview and do some sort of a quick version of it before we put Guy into the practice with feedback. Um, and what information needs to be presented prior to the demonstration and application exercises, and there's this kind of content. And what content already exists, we take little notes about each one of those things, which box have we got covered already. Maybe we've got a stakeholder interview guide here, the third piece of information. So that's good. We don't have to create that here. Everything else, maybe we have to build from scratch. Um, and again, what barriers exist because I want everybody, my design team, my clients, the stakeholders, I want everybody thinking about what's going to stop this from transferring back out there on the job. And how are we going to contend with that? How are we going to pave the way and remove the barriers, et cetera, et cetera? All right. Excellent. Next questions? Yeah, we got a couple here. Um, how do you identify the high performers? And in your experience, how do the practices of the high performers typically differ from the average performers? Um, all right. So, well, uh, the average performers uh, don't they don't have what Carl Binder would call fluency and others have called fluency. But they can't do things uh, well and quickly. Um, they may eventually be effective, but they're not very efficient with their time and the resources, et cetera, et cetera. Master performers do things to some level of mastery that is known in their organizations. They know who the best of the best are. And when I, I ask, uh, I learned a long time ago that I needed to have uh, I, you know, I get a request from somebody, they're the requester, they may be the client, and then I ask for who are the other stakeholders. So if I'm dealing with salespeople, who are the regional vice presidents of sales, if you will? If it's engineers, you know, who are the uh, engineering top management uh, people? If it's uh, uh, the uh, chief financial officer, you know, who are the bean counters at every factory? Um, those are the stakeholders. I ask them to handpick my sources, the people that we want to others to emulate because they're so darn good. You know, so we were talking about basketball. We were talking about, you know, who are the Michael Jordans here? And because we want everybody to be like Mike. And so, so we, so we want them to hand pick because, and then I use peer pressure in project steering team gate review meetings where I get my stakeholders assembled and I tell them, you know, quite frankly, you know, you give me um, average performers, I'm going to produce an average product. You give me bottom of the barrel, I'll produce a piece of garbage. And I won't know because I don't do the job for a living. And you give me your top performers, those people that it hurts to take out of the performance context for a day or two or three, you give them to me and I'll produce a top level stellar product. It's a business decision, short-term pain for the long-term gain. Now, you know, tell me who you're volunteering for this effort. And I've had clients call each other, but I'd say, they'd say things like, hey, I'm giving my best person here. You pick Guy Wallace. We all know he's a dud. And if, you know, if you're going to do that, why am I giving my best person and you're going to not do that? What's up with that? You know, and so it's peer pressure working with executives so that they'll pick really the top people. Now, usually if they're not willing to pick a top person, they're not too enthralled by the whole nature of the project. And that's a business decision for the project steering team as to whether we should do this or not, whether we should just leave it to informal and social learning means versus a formal approach that we may be undertaking here. Here's a comment from Kathleen and I'd like it to comment. It seems like this is a good way to get requesters, SMEs, to get away from their vision of a course agenda to what is really desired, a, an improvement in performance. Yes. Um, so clients off, uh, I was reminded of this just recently here, Joe Harless back in 1985 gave a conference presentation where he, I think he was tired of people saying, well, you shouldn't be an order taker. You should, you know, you should push back. And <laughs> so he got up in the, at the podium and spoke and said, you know, you sh if you get a request for training, you shouldn't ask in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? Um, no, he said, I, you should say, yes, I'm happy to help you. And I can help you even more if you let me do this thing called front end analysis. And then he would explain that. So uh, yeah, we need to, we need not focus on the means that we might employ for the ends of performance. We, but we need to say yes and go through. And I like to take my customers, my clients on the journey through analysis, through design, 
and have them come to the logical conclusion whether or not training is going to support this. If you'll remember, the performance model had a bunch of DE kinds of things on there, deficiencies of the environment. Now, we can't fix the deficiencies of the environment through training, but we can sure warn the learners that there are these deficiencies out there in the real world and how to anticipate and avoid them in the first place and what to do if they were unavoidable in the second place. So there's value in understanding that even though our clients may not be able to fix everything and make it all perfect for us, we've got to deal with the real world. But so, yeah, if you take a group of people through a process like that, they will change their minds several times by the time we get to the end of this and decide what are we really going to do to support and enable performance. Yeah, good point. Excellent presentation, Guy. Thank you. All right, if that's the end of the questions here, I'm gonna go through the last couple of things here. So those of you who are gluttons for punishment and aren't tired of my voice by now, you can see I did a, uh, this is a 29 minute uh, presentation on the analysis data and lesson mapping that I did um, back uh, in April of 2019. I think this was for the Atlanta chapter of ISPI. I may be mistaken on that. And then for your uh, chapter to the north, uh, the Bay Area and Boise State chapter, I did a similar thing. That's 64 minutes, so you can go even longer on that. I got dozens of blog posts on lesson maps and lesson mapping on my website. Um, I've covered this in my 1999 book. This cover was designed by Gary Rumler. He didn't like the cover I had on it, and I was asking him to review the book because I was attributing how I approached doing performance analysis to him. And if he didn't like it, I would take his name off of it. But anyway, so I got a nice little quote from him and a redesigned cover. So this was back in 99. And then just last year, what did I do during the pandemic? Well, I wrote my 15th book. Um, and this is about conducting performance-based instructional analysis throughout the addy like process. So when I'm doing project planning and kickoff, I'm doing analysis then. When I'm in the analysis phase, I'm doing analysis. When I'm doing design, I'm taking the analysis data and adding to it, extending the analysis when I'm doing design. And of course, when I get into development, I'm, at, I'm actually doing the most detailed level of analysis to develop the content that I will then pilot test and get feedback on, which is additional analysis. And then I'll update it and revise it and release it all to whatever systems the organization has in place to deploy content or to make it accessible to the audiences. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is all about performance competence, um, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. And uh, feel free if there's uh, any questions left over, I'm going to hang around for a little bit for those of you who can stay and some of you have to go. Uh, I got a lot of free resources on my website. Take advantage of those. They're under the resource tab. And uh, are there any additional questions, comments, or concerns that I can take? Yeah, everybody feel free to uh, either use chat or, or come off of mute. And one question I would have, Guy, is you provided uh, you know, a great overview today, plus some um, uh, resources for people to dig deeper. Um, have you seen, you know, people, uh, instructional designers, you know, training developers, whatever, however they characterize themselves, pick up this method and use it? How hard is it to kind of adopt? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I've been training people, my clients and my staff since 1983. I first started training people at AT&T in 1983 on this because my clients saw it in action and they wanted their staff to learn this. So I've developed probably, I don't know, maybe 30 some people that were part of my uh, previous consulting organizations uh, starting back in 1982. But I've trained people at Hewlett Packard on this. I trained hundreds of people at General Motors uh, back in the mid 90s to 2000 before we, we all got booted out of there. But uh, so yeah, there, uh, it's, it's easy for some people, it depends on how their heads are wired. You know, if they're kind of engineering types, then they pick up on this easier. Uh, artists among us struggle with that kind of thing. Yeah, outstanding, thank you.